Hello. Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, Welcome David and Brian, and welcome to everybody listening. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has heightened our dependence on gig workers while laying bare the vulnerabilities that gig workers face and the inequalities built into the gig economy. As part of GMF Digital's work to ensure that technology supports democracy, we're delighted today to be featuring two experts to discuss these critical issues. David Wheel is the Dean and Professor of the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. He served in the Obama administration as the administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at the US Department of Labor, and he led the Wage and Hour Division. Uh, he's written five books, and most recently, The Fissured Workplace, Why Work Became So Bad for So Many, and What Can Be, Do to improve, what can be Done to Improve It. Brian Chen is a staff attorney with the National Employment Law Project, a critically important organization that advocates to end worker exploitation in non-standard work structures, such as the on-demand economy. Uh, so we're going to um, talk to David and Brian. Uh, they'll speak for about 30 minutes, and then we're gonna open it up to questions, which I'll be happy to moderate. To submit a question, uh, we would ask you to, quick, uh, to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat button. And we'll be asking uh, your questions to David and to Brian. Um, I'm gonna start out with David, and I'd like you to, to tell us why we should care. Uh, you talk about something called the fissured workplace. Uh, can you tell us what that is and what has COVID-19 and the accompanying economic um, uh, dislocation revealed about the fissured workplace and why we should care about it. Um, thanks, Karen. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, you know, I think that the fissured workplace, which I'll describe in a moment, is something that has been with us in many ways hidden from us uh, because we don't see how work has really been reorganized in, uh, in our economy over the last um, many decades, really 20, 30 years. Um, but it has been, in a way, revealed by uh, the pandemic and the economic dislocation that's come with it. And I, I would just give you several vignettes to both illustrate how it's been revealed and what the fissured workplace is. Um, early on in the pandemic, we saw a lot of workers um, who are in what I would call fissured relationships. These are workers who, though they work for a company, they are often distanced from that company through a variety of organizational mechanisms. Um, a lot of the digital platform business models we know most famously from Uber or Lyft, but companies like Instacart, DoorDash, a lot of the people who were doing delivery of food and products to our homes uh, throughout the pandemic to this day um, are those kinds of workers. And we saw a lot of those workers like Instacart workers uh, who went on strike or work stoppages because they weren't being given proper protective uh, equipment to do that work and therefore were exposed to uh, the coronavirus in early days. Um, there was a case, and this has happened in healthcare organizations in many places, where you have workers who are not to, who work day to day for a healthcare organization, but they're distanced from those organizations through staffing arrangements, subcontracting, third-party management. There was a case, a very striking case in Bellingham, Washington, again, in the early days of the pandemic of an emergency room physician, uh, Dr. Ming Lin, who had worked for uh, a healthcare or a hospital, Peace Health St. Joseph Medical Center, for 17 years, um, he voiced concern about the lack of medical equipment for his coworkers, he was fired. It turns out he didn't directly work for that hospital. He worked for a staffing agency called Team Health who reassigned him basically to oblivion because he had exercised those rights. That's a you know, second example of a broken relationship where on one hand, Dr. Lin was an emergency room doc for a hospital doing the work governed by that hospital, yet his employment relationship was through the staffing agency. And the third example I'd give you happened um, just about a month or more ago, where in Michigan, uh, on top of the pandemic, there were floods that led to some dam breaks in part of Michigan. 
um, the Mid Michigan Medical Center, a, a, um, a hospital uh, in northern Michigan, Michigan um, was affected by these floods. They needed to have someone come in to clean up the hospital, including, unfortunately, the morgue of the hospital. They hired a company called ServPro uh, um, to come in. ServPro is a franchised operator. Uh, ServPro assured the hospital that the workforce would be provided uh, protective equipment um, for the work that would be done. But the local ServPro franchisee went out and hired a staffing agency called PT BTN Service. The staffing agency brought in workers from Texas and Florida, housed those workers together in a common hotel rooms. Um, these workers did the work without proper protective equipment. And by the end of their time cleaning up this hospital, um, 20 of those workers had COVID, uh, probably transmitted COVID to other people they were working with. In, uh, in the cleanup effort, and then went back to Texas and Florida and other places where they lived and brought the virus with them. So again, you had this very broken relationship and these, break, these different versions of what I just described are all examples of this idea of a fissured workplace where major companies often who we identify with a service or a product um, have no longer, even though they're directing everything that creates that product, no longer are the employers of record. And as a result of it, whether it is poorer wages that those workers receive, absence of benefits to protections, or the kind of exposure to health risk that we're seeing in COVID um, are the result of that. And it's really this presence of the pandemic revealing these problems that um, in many ways speaks to the pervasiveness of these kinds of employment relationships in a lot of our economy, really, um, in a way that people often don't perceive. Thank you. That, that really sets the stage uh, beautifully. Brian, um, help us understand, now that we know why we should care, what's, what's the law? What, what, what is an employee? What's a, a, an independent contractor or a non-standard worker, a contingent worker, um, a franchisee, you know, freelance, we have all these words. Are they all different? Are there two categories? And where, what is this thing called a gig economy worker or a gig worker? Is that a different thing or is that um, not really a legal category? Yeah, the, the, the phrase gig worker or app-based worker by itself has no legal meaning. Um, mm -hmm. When people talk about gig workers and the way that the companies talk about their workers, they call them independent contractors. So that's the the distinction really is between independent contractor and an employee. And part of the problem is that we have such a scattering of labor and employment laws with different definitions of employee uh, who counts as an employee. But generally at the state level, they, there are two tests. One is the common law test and the other is called the ABC test, which people may have heard about and, and, and seen in California, they're having a big, uh, fight over their, their ABC test. But uh, I'll, I'll describe those tests. So the first one is the common law test, which essentially is looking at uh, the uh, employers, it looks at a number of factors and it tries to balance them. And, and it's generally looking at how much control the employer has over the worker. Uh, part of the problem is that it is really this multi-factor balancing test, none of which is really determinative and a lot of advocates you know, have really criticized this test as saying it comes down to what breakfast the judge ate that morning, what was the weather when they drove into work. It's really hard to uh, have any predictability or clarity over who fits as an employee under that test. And the problem is that companies know this and that they can game it. They know that the law is poorly set up to hold them accountable. And so companies, as, as David was describing, you know, companies will use all manner of sleight of hand to obscure the actual employment relationship, to obscure the level of control because that test is so poorly made to actually get at who is an employee. And that's why a lot of people, uh, are, my, my organization, NELP included, really think that the ABC test is the, be the better test and the best test for who's an employee. Um, and it's named that because there are three factors in A, B, and C. 
you know, I won't get, get into the, the legal mechanics of how it works because people's eyes can kind of glaze over. I will say that this is the simplest and most clear definition of who is an employee. And it means that regardless of what an employer may call you, if you are under their control or direction, you are an employee. If you provide services that are in the company's usual course of business, you're an employee. And if you're not regularly holding yourself out as a small business owner, you're an employee. And that really matters because we have so many benefits and protections that are attached to employee status. Uh, you know, the, the, the basic social contract, more or less, is that work ought to be a place where you can work safely, you can work with dignity, you don't have to be subject to discrimination, you can work together with others. And when employers misclassify their workers and call them independent contractors when they're really not, what they are effectively doing is removing a lot of those protections and rewriting the social contract. And so when an employer misclassifies someone, which is extremely, extremely prevalent in what we call the gig economy, that means that those workers don't have any wage and hour protections. They aren't entitled to state disability, workers' compensation, employer subsidized healthcare, uh, unemployment insurance, which is so critical right now. They are unable to have a pathway to unionize and to build power in their workplace. So all of these are really basic protections that are always needed, uh, but especially now in, in, in kind of a, a crisis like we are facing right now. And that's why we are seeing so many app-based workers who are just really, really struggling. And I think what's particularly dispiriting about this is that as much as ordinary regular people who are using these apps, who use these services, start to understand that what, what, what is happening to these workers is so unfair, it is so inequitable, we are seeing a lot of the same big app companies like Uber, like Lyft, like Instacart, they have really doubled down on this business model. Uh, so they are spending lots of money to fight legislation, to fight uh, enforcement in the courts, all to ensure that you know, they get to continue to cut the corners at the expense of their workers. Can you, can you just to um, add some more meat to that, you mentioned California. I think people may be aware that there was a law passed in California that everybody called the Uber law and then Uber said that it didn't apply to them. Could you just give us a thumbnail uh, explanation of what's going on there? Yeah, so it, it really started in 20, 2018 when the California Supreme Court decided this case called Dynamics, uh, in which case that the court was grappling with um, uh, as I was describing before, they had an earlier case, Borello, which was the common law test of who's an employee. Uh, it, you know, as I was describing, it's, it's, it's very gameable, it's not predictable, it's, it, it doesn't offer much clarity in terms of who's really an employee. And so the court there took the ABC test and applied it to the state's uh, wage orders, so their wage, um, minimum wage. And what happened after that is that the California state legislature took that holding the ABC test and extended it across all of the state's employment laws. So to include things like disability, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, other critical benefits. Uh, so that was the law assembly bill five or AB five. It was passed in 2019. Uh, it was signed into law by the governor and it officially became uh, the law of the land in California, January 1st. And, and so all three, really all three branches of state government have been very clear on the issue in California that worker misclassification is a huge issue. It creates all these harms to workers, to honest businesses, to the general public. And what we're starting to see now is that now that they have Assembly Bill 5 on the books, uh, the, the, the city attorneys and the state attorney general can now go after a lot of these bad employers, and we are seeing that uh, there's, a, there's a case in, in San Diego where the city sued Instacart saying, you have been misclassifying your workers. Uh, the attorney general has sued Uber and Lyft saying, you are misclassifying your workers, and these are all the harms that it leads to. In San Francisco, the district attorney sued DoorDash 
saying that they're doing this the same uh, misclassification. So really it's about the kinds of laws that we equip um, our state to have to, to fight such blatant worker abuse that leads to wage theft and all these um, dispossession of rights. That's but great. Could, could, I just, could I just jump in and I, I just would wind, I, I, I agree with what Brian just described about where AB5 came from and what, what this, the current kind of battle looks like. But I would wind the clock back a little bit because okay. AB5 really came from um, a, a particular business model that was promoted actively by venture capital money around the time that Uber and Lyft really emerged and became, you know, I mean, became a verb. I mean, I mean Uber is such a brand that we say, let's go Uber. Um, but what happened, I, I would even want to wind the, back, the clock back even further because what I'm describing as a fissured workplace really started again emanating from a lot of pressure from private and public capital markets to major businesses coming out, and particularly after our last great recession in 2008, yeah. a lot of businesses who were in the immediate effect of that great recession cut back, used staffing agencies, used subcontracting, used a lot of these models yeah. and kind of said, hey, this is pretty cool. We can direct these workforces. We can get all the goodies that you get from managing a workforce but we don't have to own the workers. We can shift that on to other players. Um, and that became a much more common thing through a lot of different types of models. You know, that presaged what we saw somewhere around 2011, 12, 13, 14, and 15, where venture capital, particularly in Silicon Valley, looked at the Uber model and the Lyft model that were becoming were growing so rapidly and said, why don't we apply this everywhere? Why don't we just say, um, we're just providing the platform. We're just doing algorithms, folks. This is not management. Um, and that became, you know, the expansion of these models is why you see DoorDash and you see Stint and you see, you know, any number of companies that seem to be vowel challenged. You can't use a regular vowel to set up these business models, apparently. Um, but this is what then fueled particularly, I think, sensitivities in California about how these models were creating a whole class of workers who were still being directed, no, not by old fashioned management systems, but I think one of the key things we should talk about is algorithms are management systems. Yeah, so I, I, that's exactly where I wanted to go. To, so yeah. two, two, uh, two totally separate directions that I want to take from what you just said. One is, um, let's talk about what it is about the platform. And, and there's a NELP report that I was just reviewing this morning that talks a lot about this. What is it about... Um, the use of the platform for a company like Handy or Uber um, that uh, adds to this story. So first we've heard about there's a big problem and it goes, it goes back before the last recession. I mean, I was writing about these things in 2002, you know, there was a Microsoft case where they had uh, workers that had been misclassified, women who wanted to go part-time were classified. So there's always been this fissure between non-standard workers and employees that's been heightened, uh, people are exploiting that division, but then, then comes the platform. Uh, t t talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, David and Brian. Um, what is it about the platform that makes it easier for them to make the argument, but also uh, what other ancillary problems does that introduce into the, the market for work? Right, well, yeah. I yeah, Brian, go ahead. Okay, well, I, I would agree entirely with what David just said. You know, misclassification is not at all new or unique to yeah. uh, the gig economy. Really, any bad employer in any industry is familiar with this idea that if you, you, can, you can cut corners and you can boost your own profits and you're not having to pay all these payroll taxes. You know, everyone knows that. Uh, really, what the gig companies have done is they have taken a very... Uh, common illegal business practice. They have put it through their corporate spin machine 
and they have sold it to the public as flexible work. And a big part of their argument really, as, as you were describing, Karen, is that they, they claim that they, they are merely mediating work through their labor platform, that they are just connecting small business owners to small gig opportunities. Um, and, and when you really look at it, that so-called flexibility really vanishes when you, when you think about what these, these platforms are doing. I mean, it may be the case that Uber and Lyft do not explicitly tell their drivers what to do, how to do it, but the companies have hired teams of behavioral scientists that can use all these tricks and algorithms through the app to really shape and manage their workforce, uh, including worker schedules, their availability, their activities. Uh, it's, it's been well documented that Uber has hired people that use video game techniques that have little kind of mental tricks to get people to work longer, work harder. It uses certain reminders to ensure that drivers are staying on the road. There are uh, just as, as we all watch Netflix and then you watch an episode and then it does the autoplay and you keep binge watching, there are algorithms that the platforms use to preload their next ride or their next fare to ensure that they're on the road. Uh, so, you know, whatever flexibility that an app-based worker may have on paper, that flexibility is so carefully monitored and supervised uh, and, and really, it, it's, it's just uh, control by any other name. Uh, it, it may look different. The trappings of power may look different, but it is power nonetheless that the companies are exerting over their workforce. So, so David, maybe I'll sharpen my question a little bit. If you, if you turn the clock back, there was always this uh, loophole in the way we treat workers in that, you know, if you were an employee, you had a bunch of protections, but also benefits. And if you weren't, uh, then you didn't. And that was narrowly construed and probably not very coincidentally, um, if you were an immigrant, if you were of color, if you were a woman, you, your job might not be classified uh, such that you were an employee. And so you missed out on, on a lot of those protections and benefits. Is it time to rethink that division uh, in, in that, insofar as that loophole seems to be swallowing up the economy. And, and how would you t talk to us about what that distinction does, how federalism plays into it, and, and what we might do differently? Right. No, those are a lot of great questions bundled in that. Let me, let me pick up a few threads. I mean, number one, you, you said in, in passing, it's very true. Historically, some of our basic labor protections have exempted um, women and have particularly exempted people of color from them. The, beginning with um, the, the statute, my agency that I used to work, I used to head up uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act excluded large classes of workers just preemptorily um, uh, who were from primarily black or people of color. Um, and as you also imply, right now many of the workers in these kinds of positions are disproportionately black and people of color and women and so you have adding on to um, decades if not centuries of that kind of racial injustice um, uh, and, and gender injustice um, this additional kind of business model you know i think part of another part of your very of your question that's really important to understand is you're right this problem or this loophole has existed going way back. You know, one of the earliest cases on this that came to the Supreme Court came under the National Labor Relations Act in the 30s about something called newsies, the, the kids mm -hmm. who handed out newspapers and were they or were they not covered. So what has changed and what's made it so much more pervasive is really the capacity of a con company to allow people to work in this kind of fashion, the kind of situation that Brian just aptly described in regards to Uber and algorithm and so on, the technology has allowed greater monitoring. So you can pull off what one thing you want to do. You need a glue to make sure these people who are no longer your employees are still doing everything you want them to do. And then you can use the loophole. And I think that's what we're seeing. And that's what's become so 
apparent in these kinds of platform models um, in that what, what Brian described is what I would call a management system. And if, if you ask me, I mean, I used to teach business, I, I taught in a business school for many years. And if, if you had asked me with my business school hat, what's Uber, I'd say, it's a brilliant business model. It's certainly better than taxi cab service. And the reason it works, and the reason going back to something I said, it's a verb, is because it's a coherent model of management. And so we have to get back to the fact, well, that means all those folks are their employees. You know, that's really what we have to now re-recognize that in terms of the statute, whether it's AB5 or the Fair Labor Standards Act, which has a very expansive definition of employment, these, the model of why we want to protect employee workers under employment models is pretty clear. What we have to get back to is the discussion to say it's appropriate to, to reassert if you get all the benefits of these workers doing your work, then you have to provide them a set of rights and protections that we have, you know, made clear going back to the early part of the 1900s. I mean, so that's where we have to come back to closing a loophole that has been enabled by a lot of technologies, including the technologies that fuel platform uh, business models. And, and what about, um, and this is, uh, I think it's uh, for David again, but Brian chime in, what about benefits and, and extending benefits? Right, absolutely. And, and I think, unfortunately, one of the, um, I think the debates that has kind of been confounded, there are a lot of people who say, look, workers of today are going to be holding a lot of different jobs. And therefore, and doing a lot of different, you know, this is where the word gig is used, I think, a little ingenuously sometimes. They're going to do a lot of gigs. We want to give them benefits. So let's, let's walk away from some of this right stuff that are onerous, and we'll give them portable benefits. It's sort of a either or choice. And I, and I think that's a false choice. I think we, we do need to acknowledge the fact that workers of today will have more jobs and maybe shorter term kinds of jobs than in the past. But we, we know ways of providing benefits for those workers. There are ways that, for instance, in the construction industry, there have been funds that people pay in for health and welfare and pension and training, um, paid time off, different ways of figuring out how a worker who is an employee can have benefits tied to a particular job, a particular piece of work, and separately also enjoy the set of rights and protections we also want to make sure it happen. You know, there are different kinds of mechanisms you want to set up, but they're not impossibilities. You know, when, when I have had, and I have had, in, when I was administrator, discussions with gig platform um, executives, Mm -hmm. would say, oh, it's so hard to do that. You know, how could we possibly do it? That's why we need independent contracting. And I would say, are you, are you really kidding me? You, your models have timing down to milliseconds in terms of what drives your business. It ain't that hard to attach whether <laughs> it's paying into a benefit fund or making sure someone is being treated as on the clock using the exact same kinds of systems to, to, uh, to, to, to assure that. So I think benefits, yes, these workers often don't receive them, but that's a matter of policy choice. It's not an inevitability of technology or the nature of modern business. In what do you think, opinion. Brian? Should, should there be a third category of employment for a, a gig worker uh, or portable benefits for gig workers? Well, with, with respect to your first question, I, I think it's really dangerous to go down that road of, of a third category. I know a lot of companies have portrayed or tried to portray this as there's these old school uh, dual binary system of employee and independent contractor. Why don't we create a third thing that reflects the modern day realities of what work is like for all these gig workers? 
And I think that gives into a, a lot of the environment that these, these own companies have conjured up, which is really that it, it, this is an employee relationship and, and uh, it's been put through this spin of flexible work and, and the gig economy and technological innovation, but by any other name, it is the same kind of control that really is an employee relationship. But even aside from all of that, you know, the, create, the creation of a third category of worker would not reduce misclassification. It actually would accelerate it because it would give, uh, it, it would just create another level to which uh, bad employers could push, could push down their workers into that uh, sub-level that has fewer benefits, receives fewer protections, and it just creates an another, another incentive for a bad employer to uh, cut corners to, to boost their own profits. And I, I agree a lot with what David said about portable benefits. Um, you know, a lot of our existing benefits are portable already. <laughs> Even if we think of, you know, social security as old school, like that's a portable benefit. And so let's start with making sure that everyone uh, who should have access to all those benefits really can access them. And so get, getting back to the short term and to uh, what's going on with the coronavirus and the economic downturn, uh, the CARES Act had some really innovative protections. Um, there's a new law who's got too long a name, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that also has some additional uh, benefits. Um, uh, maybe I'll turn back to David, but um, do you see those as offering a, a promise of what we should be doing in the short term or the, the short to medium term, depending on how long this pandemic situation lasts, to try out some things to offer greater protection to workers? And many of these workers, I should say, are essential workers. These, this right. is not a separate category from the, the heroes that we talk about every day who are in our grocery stores, as you pointed out, in our hospitals and so on. So, um, and, then, and then there are many workers who have lost their jobs. So um, tell us a little bit about what we should be doing in the short term uh, and, and what we saw in those two acts. Right. Well, I think, I think for the reasons you stated, both acts were definitely state steps in the right direction. I mean, in particular, the CARES Act had this, has a pandemic, pandemic unemployment assistance program precisely for the kinds of workers we're talking about. Now, it's been a hard stretch to get that actually implemented. Um, ultimately, unemployment insurance is carried out at the state level and states vary enormously in both how they administer and the rules around their systems and then their ability to administer them. Um, and, the, and the pandemic unemployment assistance basically said, we will give gig type workers, workers who do not necessarily whether appropriately or not, are being classified as employees, we're gonna give them access to unemployment insurance. And that is an important step forward. It, um, it is authorized through the end of December. I hope it is extended, uh, that we know the pandemic's gonna go on a lot longer than that. And it's also for the reason that, that, that Brian and I have described, it's something that's a feature of our economy and so we should extend it. Um, the, uh, the FFCRA that you mentioned um, provided much less comprehensive expansion of paid sick leave to at least some classes of workers through a very complicated tax subsidy. It has been very poorly administered by the Trump Labor Department um, uh, and has not had the kind of effect that I think we want to have. People who are worried about whether they've been a, uh, in, um, exposed to the virus the last thing you want those workers to do is to go to work. You want right. them to feel they can stay at home. Um, we already know our healthcare system that has also been undermined by the Trump administration, the ACA system has made people more likely to go to work even if they're sick. We need to really expand that. I think just in response to clearly the pandemic is still at, 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 at its initial height, if not greater, we need to make sure that those healthcare protections are there. There are too many low wage workers. And again, too many particularly people of color who are being exposed to these kinds of frontline risks that we need a better net. I mean, the other thing I would say immediately that this administration in an astounding way 
has not used is the power to issue emergency standards under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, they have offered guidance, but mm -hmm. they have done no enforcement. They have, they have not responded in any meaningful way for the complaints that have come in to OSHA um, to say, we need protections for workers that, by the way, also protect consumers in service kinds of situations, like restaurants or, or uh, grocery stores. We need to issue real reg, um, uh, standards to protect workers and the public. Um, we need to do that immediately. They could do it if they wanted to, uh, and that's going to remain a very critical thing to, to put in place uh, in, the, in, in terms of the short term. And Brian, and, and, what, what else would you do in the short term? And, and what do you say to people who say, well, we can't have you know, regulations getting in the way of, of economic recovery? And well, if, yeah. Well, if I may, I, I would actually, uh, I, I may hold a, a more critical view than David of the pandemic unemployment assistance or, or the PUA program. Um, you know, it, it was established by the emergency congressional CARES Act, it clearly was designed to be a, a, a lifeline to people who really need it. It's worth noting that in the CARES Act, that program was established for people who are self-employed and people who are ineligible for state UI. Uh, and, and it says nothing, nowhere does it say in the words gig workers, doesn't say anything about the app economy. And really it was companies who pressured the Department of Labor to issue guidance to say, when they say self-employed people, they are clearly referring to gig workers. They're referring to Uber drivers, Lyft drivers. And that creates this um, bad incentive, really, because a lot of the companies are using this federal PUA program, which is a, a good thing on its own, but they are using it really to bless the misclassification of yeah. their workers. And in a lot of ways, it is they're using it to enshrine their workers' status as independent contractors, not as employees. And and, and critically, of course, the, the, this program is federally funded um, and, and the company's uh, employers do not pay into it. And so in a lot of ways, this really has been a federal bailout for these gig companies who have misclassified their workers, who have failed to pay into unemployment uh, trust funds at the state level. A recent estimate found that if Uber and Lyft had been responsible, had been paying all these unemployment taxes in the state of California for, I believe, the last five years, together that the companies would owe about $413 million in unpaid unemployment premiums. Um, and, and so, you know, what these companies really have gotten away with depleting these state coffers and yet are praising this federal program that is a good program on its own, but I, I do want to be careful in, in, in thinking about how the companies have used them. And it's also worth noting that, you know, I, I've made the case, uh, I think, that their workers very clearly are employees in a lot mm -hmm. of states. Those workers have applied to receive state UI as employees and are receiving them as employees. Um, and state UI, in most cases, offers more robust benefits than the federal PUA. So someone who works for, uh, drives for Uber stands to, and, and is out of work, stands to get a more robust benefits uh, package from the state uh, unemployment rather than through this federal unemployment program. So what, what would you do if there's a new um, bill uh, to provide relief during the pandemic, Brian? How, how would you, you know, what would you say are some emergency things to do that set the table for longer term reform? Well, I think first of all, and, and this would apply to all workers, is to extend the $600 benefits that are attached to unemployment. Uh, that has been a, a huge lifeline. It's been such a boost to our economy. I can't believe it's even being discussed that we're not going to renew it. So we, sh we should start with extending the $600 benefits. And then in terms of, um, you know, the PUA program should go on, but I, I would hope that Congress uh, clarifies that people who already are employees under state laws uh, should be able to access those, those, that state UI and that it should be easier for them to access it. And the Department of Labor really has a role to play there in, in making sure that those state agencies are uh, quickly and, and swiftly administering those benefits to misclassified workers. 
And I guess one, one of the things that has been talked about a lot over time in the ACA sort of takes a walk in this direction is separating benefits, not, not protections, not workplace safety protections, but, um, but benefits from, uh, from work. Uh, so that uh, just because you're an American, you should be able to get health care, you should be able to get sick leave, you should be able to get uh, paid um, family leave. Um, and uh, David, I, just, I wonder if you would talk about that a little bit and, and which things, if you agree with that, which things fall in sort of, how do you think about which things attach to employment and which things are separate from employment? Um, and I know that a lot of other countries have are, have gotten there before us, but there's a there's a a sense in the American mind that that's made their economies more sclerotic. It hasn't given young people a chance to enter. So, as you describe it, if you would start think you know help us anticipate those critiques. Sure. Um, no, a, a great question, and I think it's you know it's certainly one of the issues that in the Obama administration really fueled making the Affordable Care Act a huge priority. I think that is the number one priority that we, you know, there are a lot of historic reasons we tied healthcare provision to employers uh, in an inappropriate way, unfortunately, that, that created the, the great gaps in coverage that we have. And I think that's where we gotta get back to that. We have to re-strengthen the ACA and then improve it. I mean, I think, um, Everyone or most people I knew in the administration, in the Obama administration, acknowledged the ACA was far from perfect, but it was pushing us to say this should be a fundamental right as a person to have health care coverage. And I think that's fundamental. Um, I think there are a lot of protections that where I would push um, our, our, or where I would say our policies fail and we have to revise them is there are a lot of protections we should pr provide based on work. Not whether you're an employee, not whether you're an independent contractor, but saying, if you're doing work, there are certain things you should be assured of. You should be assured, we haven't mentioned it, but sexual harassment, if you are an independent contractor, you are not protected from sexual harassment because on paper, you have no employer. There's no one who you, you can act on in terms of that relationship. Um, retaliation for the use of any right, any substantive right at the workplace should link to work, not whether or not you're an employee. I think health and safety, as this pandemic has illustrated and our discussion has raised, needs to be related to work and not uh, the employment relationship. The simple notion Something that I felt so passionately about in the, in the wage and hour division that we did was the notion that if you work, you are paid, that that is an inviolable and that you're paid at least some acceptable minimum. I, you know, again, I think we have to get, because of the nature of what we've talked about in this session, um, rethink this notion that somehow we're going to make it available to some or others. Those are, those are, and that would require a substantial change, uh, although in my view, not a, a, an incomprehensible one in our basic employment policies. That's what we need to, in a more fundamental way, start to take on and address, along with providing health care coverage and these basic kinds of provisions against downside risks um, as a society. Brian, what do you... I I, I would agree with a lot of what David said. I, I'm all for universal benefits. I think healthcare clearly is a human right and it is not a benefit for those who happen to be working. The discussions around universal basic income are exciting and I, I hope they uh, continue to have those discussions to see where that may lead in terms of a policy solution. But you know, as as we think about benefits uh, and and the, what we attach or not to work, you know, it 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 is worth thinking about: Are we letting employers off the hook, mm -hmm. and and how can we ensure that they are paying their fair share? Because the reality is that we do live in an economic system where workers are building value for other people's business rather than for themselves. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a wage labor uh, system. And that means that employers really ought to hold certain responsibilities. And I, you know, I'm all for more universal benefits, but let's let's hold on to 
let's figure out what protections and benefits really do need to attach to protect workers. Yeah, so, so you're talking about the payment side as opposed to the, um, as opposed to uh, claiming the benefits and, and then that gets to a whole issue of, you know, could you, could you tax everyone in a fair way or should you just maintain the employer responsibility? And it gets a really interesting thread to pull on, especially in a winner take all kind of economy that we have. And when we talk about these platforms, it's very much, you know, one of huge scale uh, where capital is is getting an awful awful great return. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't. I would be remiss. I'm just going to um, uh, use the power of the moderator to just you know stress um, you know things like sick leave and family leave, which are important in any situation. Like our, we're so far behind every single country, not just industrialized countries, in this respect, and that you know. Again, I think our, we have to think about those as universal and family supports, and they don't necessarily get captured in a in a um, universal benefit, um, and I, especially in a pandemic. The fact that we don't really have secure sick leave means that you know why so many people are not going to be willing to get tested, are not going to want uh, to identify their friends if their friends are going to lose a job if it turns out that they could have been infected. Uh, so the fact that we don't have those protections right now, where I can take a day off to care for my sick child, or if I get sick, I can stay home, is just seems, it's always been crazy, but it's it's so self-defeating right now in the middle of the of the crisis. It, it, you know, we're a few months away from a, a presidential election, and um, and there's you know a lot of work going on in the states uh, that's that's very interesting. Um, what what do you all, you know, if you're thinking a little longer term uh, and you want to think about locking in some of the good uh, state work um, and, uh, uh, you know, setting forth some bigger, bigger, uh, bigger reforms, what would you, what would you say if, if, um, if either Donald Trump too or Joe Biden comes in, um, you want to think big, you want to protect American workers, you know, here are some big ticket items that, that you should think about. What, why don't we start? I keep starting with David. I want to start with Brian this time. I think a great place to start would be uh, the PRO Act. It's, it's the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. It is a federal bill. It has passed the House of Representatives. The Senate uh, is not taking it up uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but essentially what this bill would do would be to uh, really update and correct our, our labor laws around collective bargaining and the National Labor Relations Act. And it would, in many respects, um, overturn right to work laws. But critically, you know, it, it would extend through the ABC test, the ability to collectively organize, uh, unionize and, and collectively bargain for a lot of these app based workers, because because it has a more expansive and clear test of employee workers for these platforms would be uh, classified as employees under the NLRA and would be able to ha have that uh, collective bargaining and actually build power in their workplaces. And I think that would be a great place to start in addition to all the other kinds of uh, state classification uh, bills that have been percolating up after California's AB5 and that we're probably gonna see a lot more of as, as AB5 is enforced. But at the federal level, I think the PRO Act is a great place to start. And David, what do you think? And, and are you heartened at all? I'll, I'll, just to make a different question, are you heartened at all by some of these business groups saying, um, uh, you know, even before the Black Lives Matter protests, saying we, we have to worry about more than shareholder value, we have to look at greater societal well-being, and now making a lot of statements about economic justice. If you were, if you were to argue to them why they should support some big reforms, I mean, maybe, maybe talk about the reforms you would support and why you would think um, they, they should support those. Yeah, I, um, uh, I, I'm always somewhat skeptical about those <laughs> kinds of statements. Um, you can go back to the 1920s, right before the New Deal, where you can find a similar period of businesses saying, oh, we need to be treating workers better. I think there are some employers that really, you know, walk the talk, um, but there is also a lot of hand wringing that I don't know where it really leads, particularly 
if you don't have the kind of um, on the ground movement, social movements that we're seeing right now, whether it is the movements around um, working people who are fed up with the situation or the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think intersects with many of these issues in the, in the larger call for racial justice. Um, I, I, to me, the big picture, and, 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 and it supports the particular legislation that um, Brian was talking about, we haven't talked explicitly about the fact that we have the largest earnings inequality in this country since the 1920s. And the wealth gaps become even more, or even, even dwarf those. Um, and we need to address the, the growth in inequality. Um, you know, excuse, that's my dog. Um, I'm home alone. She agrees. She agrees, that's, that was, a, yes, emphatically. Um, so I think it's, we need to take on the undermining of worker, really worker power in the labor market that has happened for decades, partly through the fissuring of the economy, partly through the decline of the labor movement in the economy, um, and partly from the fact that we have had, not only in the Trump administration, but in many administrations, in tax policies and other policies affecting the corporate sector that has led to more and more of the value added of our economy, and you mentioned this, Karen, in your earlier remarks, has shifted the capital away from labor. So I think underlying any policy prescription we take has to be the fundamental question, what does this do to inequality and the ability of workers to have more power and leverage in the labor market? And how does that ultimately affect economic inequality, which has a very direct connection to political inequality? Um, and so any legislative matter that I would hope the Biden administration, I won't go to your other scenario, but into the in a Biden administration to look at um, would really be about redressing economic inequality, um, racial inequality, and political inequality in the country, which, um, you know, to your initial part of your question, I think in some ways has fueled some business people's recognition that it has grown so out of control in this in, in our society that it even threatens some of their business model. That if you create so many people who are economically disadvantaged, it ultimately unwinds the economy as a whole. Here, here, uh, David. <laughs> I agree with that. We're going to write a manifesto after this. Um, I want to give you. This has been such a rich conversation, and we're going to follow up with you. Uh, for sure. After this, um, I, I'd love to. Um, I'd love to have you close out, and um, maybe share with us. You know what people can do who um, who care about these issues if they want to a learn more, uh, b if they want if they want to do something. Uh, you know what what can they do, and c I guess if you, uh, you know I can hear in my head the prevailing co common wisdom, which isn't wisdom, which is, you know, our companies will never be able to compete if we go back to these old models, if we don't get them, let them use these new models. Um, uh, it'll hold them down, China's coming, you know. So as you, as you share your final thoughts, you know, how would not only, not only what can people do to learn more, what can they do to get involved, but how can, they, how can they think about this in an optimistic way? We're not talking about turning back the clock. We're talking about unleashing something. I'll, I'll let Brian go again. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Okay, um, can tie us up. Know, yeah. I, I would say, I, I would recommend to people um, just in, in thinking about what it is that the gig economy, in quotes, is, you know, I, I think a lot of people tend to think of the gig economy as this exceptional separate, unique, special part of the economy, it really is just the economy. I mean, it's really just a lot of services that are, are offered to, to consumers through an app. And the gig economy has done so well because I think they've been very successful in cloaking themselves in these myths that they are exceptional, that they're a new type of work, they're a future of work, and that we're not going back to the old inflexible ways of employment. And really that, you know, we've described at length how that is a, a 
conscious business can model. Can I interrupt you for one second, Brian? Talk about yeah. that flexibility too. Like, can workers have flexibility in your oh, model? Of course. Of course. I mean, I, I, there is nothing in the laws that say you're either an employee or you get to enjoy flexibility. No law anywhere that I'm aware of says anything like that. It's, it's really companies that are forcing that, that uh, choice that workers have to make. And so, of course, you can have flexibility as a W-2 employee. I think COVID has shown us that companies are willing to grant flexibility to workers, um, you know, flexibility to work from home, flexibility to have flexible hours to accommodate kids' schedules, you know. A lot of employees, um, even a lot of people in the app-based economy um, are employees and have flexibility. Uh, it, it is a false distinction that you have to forfeit uh, a certain set of rights and benefits and protections to be able to enjoy flexibility at work. Um, but to get back to what I was, I was saying, you know, I, I, I would just urge uh, people in the audience that when we talk about the gig economy, it really is not a separate thing. It is, if, if, if the word gig economy does mean anything, it, it really refers to, as David would call it, this fissuring, but really this dragging down of job quality of work standards across industries. And it, it goes even into regular full-time employee jobs and it corrodes the quality of that work as well. And so, um, you know, Nelp has made a video that I'll post in the chat and I would encourage all our, our uh, audience members to take a look at it because it really goes into what this issue of misclassification is, um, uh, what it is that the ABC test offers in terms of combating it. And if anyone in the audience happens to be a California voter, when it comes to uh, November, of course, you know, there's the presidential elections, uh, but also there are a ballot proposition that the companies have created to kind of claw their way out of any kind of regulation. They are spending upwards of $100 million to do anything to get out of it. And I would urge, if we have California voters uh, here, vote no on Prop 22. That's a little more political than GMF usually gets, but. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Karen. That's okay. <laughs> These are important issues. Go ahead, David. Those are my comments, not, not GFFs. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Go ahead, so David. I, I think to your, to your question about, um, you know, sort of this idea that these are old rules and we're going to somehow suppress creative, creative kind of the creative juice of our economy, I, I think is an old argument that, um, that doesn't hold much water. For me and the analogy I would make is um, before this administration started dismantling our environmental regulations we had decades showing as we became more stringent in our environmental regulations businesses didn't shut down they figured out how to do what they're doing in the context of more stringent regulations on air water um, and, and other forms of pollution and doing that quite effectively um, look at the ability of the Obama administration when it uh, decided to bail out the auto industry after the Great Recession by putting in very stringent emission controls, the auto companies, after grousing about it, were able to do so. And I think the exact same thing can happen under workplace regulations. You can create really cool business models Within the, within the notion that workers deserve uh, protections and rights, that the labor market is inherently an, one of unequal bargaining power. You can go back to decisions of courts in the 1920s and 30s that say that. Um, we have to go back to that, bound our business models within saying we have to make sure workers are treated right, and then we can have all kinds of creative, flexible arrangements within that. I am very heartened and optimistic by what I do see happening at the state level. If you look at the history of workplace regulation, there's always been what Brandeis called states as the laboratories of democracy that have then fueled innovation that have been adopted by government, by federal government. I think we can see the same things in some of the paid leave legislation in some of the legislation about flexibility around scheduling and protections 
and some of the legislation that Brian talked about in California and elsewhere um, protecting worker rights. I think we're seeing incredible innovation in worker organizations in the labor movement, but also outside of the labor movement. You know, groups like the National Domestic Workers Alliance that have fought hard about how do you protect very non-traditional kinds of work setups, make sure they happen and make sure workers uh, receive the protections they get. To me, what we hopefully will come into is a period of time where we can learn from all of the things that have happened at state level and all of the kinds of ideas that social movements uh, and great worker advocates like NELP have been putting out and where some progressive businesses have also innovated, using that to fashion uh, future policies for our, our country. There's a lot of great work out there that um, you can provide um, uh, GMF some links to that, that, that can really help people understand stuff that's going on that really can be the basis for new um, policies for, for the workplace um, going forward. This is uh, incredibly interesting and educational. And um, I know that uh, the audience is, is um, eager to learn more. So uh, anything that you can share with us, we'll share with, with everyone uh, uh, watching today and really appreciate all the fascinating work that both of you are, are doing. These issues are, are really misunderstood and not prioritized uh, in the way they uh, should be uh, uh, in order to solve some of the problems that we're seeing across the economy and especially right now. So thank you both for your work and for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you so much, Karen. Thanks.